a school on the cutting edge of science. That particular radiation causes cancer cells to kill themselves. And cooperation. We should find a way to live in peace. And then. I was still so trapped. A hitchhiker loses his way. I would die some ignominious death out here in the desert somewhere and nobody would even care about me. On today's 700 Club. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to this edition of the 700 Club. We've just had news that the Iranians are sending a flotilla of battleships into the area around Yemen. And ladies and gentlemen, it looks for all the world. The Saudis and the Sunnis are sending air power against the Houthi rebels, and they are blasting. And so Iran is now bringing in uh, naval power to counter the Saudis. And it may be the beginning of a major war in the Middle East between Sunni and Shia. And that's, people have been warning about that a long time. And I don't know if my crew has got me a, a map yet to show you what's going on. If you got, there it is, all right. There's Yemen. Now you see that little teeny thing there is called the Dab El Mandab, and that goes up into the Red Sea. On the other side, to the north of that, on the other side of the Peruvian Peninsula, is of course the Straits of Hormuz. Now this locks up those two little choke points. You see one around the Yemen, the one north, that locks up about 70 percent of the world's crude oil that comes out of the Persian Gulf. And if uh, the this, this, uh, Shias and the Iranians have control of the uh, uh, Straits of Hormuz and are now through these Houthi rebels, if they can take over Aden and uh, the ports surrounding the Dab El Mandeb, they could have a chokehold on, on oil and oil prices will skyrocket. So it looks like it's a shooting war and the Iranians are getting in position to do it. It may not happen, but uh, uh, who knows, but it, it's been a long simmering uh, uh, conflagration and the United States, through the ineptitude of our president, has been pouring oil on that fire. Wendy? Yeah, and many Arab nations are tired of waiting for the United States to act, so they're trying to stop Iran themselves. Gary Lane has our story. Thank you. The U.S. has stepped to the sidelines leaving it up to countries like Turkey and Iran to try to block Iran's bids for power throughout the region. On Tuesday, Turkey President Erdogan met with Iranian President Rouhani in Tehran to sign some economic cooperation agreements. But they also talked about bringing peace to Yemen. We both believe that we have to witness the end of war and bloodshed in Yemen as soon as possible. A full ceasefire must happen in Yemen and other countries should stop their attacks on Yemen. While talking peace with Turkey, Iran continues to aggressively back fellow Shiites in Yemen, rebels known as the Houthis, in their struggle to seize control of the country. Saudi Arabia has responded by launching military airstrikes against rebel positions. Saudi bombing raids on Tuesday reportedly hit a school. Injured civilians were treated at a hospital in the Yemeni capital of Sana'a. The Saudi ambassador to Washington claims Iranian revolutionary guards are now on the ground in Yemen directing Houthi rebel efforts. Turkey's Erdogan didn't want to point fingers. So far, 300,000 people have died in Yemen, all of whom are Muslims. We do not know who is killing who, and I do not want to comment on sectarian issues. What is important for me is Islam and Muslims. While in Tehran, Erdogan wanted to play the role of peacemaker, so he was unwilling to take sides. But Turkey is doing exactly that. Erdogan is aggressively supporting Sunni rebels and even ISIS fighters in their war against the Assad regime in Syria. Iran is backing Assad. Iran has also spread its influence to Kirkuk, Iraq, where Iranian Revolutionary Guards joined Iraqi government efforts to combat ISIS. The joint force defeated Islamic State fighters there and regained control of the town. More Islamic State atrocities were discovered Tuesday when Iraqi officials found a mass grave near Kirkuk. It's believed to contain the bodies of more than 1,700 people. And Christians are still suffering at the hands of the Iranian regime. As many as 90, including American Saeed Abedini, are in prison there for sharing their faith. And as Iran perhaps moves to build a Persian empire in the Middle East, the White House now says it will act to defend Saudi Arabia and America's Gulf state allies if they're attacked by Iran or its proxies. Gary Lane, CBN News.
You get the picture, ladies and gentlemen, Iran on one side. It's now the dominant player in Iraq. It is the dominant player in Syria. It is the dominant player in Lebanon. And now uh, it's the dominant player in Yemen, which is the other side of the Saudi peninsula. So we're looking at a squeeze play on the Saudis, on the Sunni uh, Muslims throughout that area, whether it is Kuwait or the Emirates or whatever. They're squeezing. And what do they want? They want to complete hegemony over that region. And we are sitting there saying, well, we just finished a nuclear agreement with them. Isn't that wonderful? And they're, the people in the Gulf are saying, oh, you've got to be kidding. All you've done is given them a pathway to unfettered nuclear uh, dominance of our region. And if they're going to be throwing nukes at us, we've got to be throwing nukes at them. So suddenly you have people who are unrestrained by the tenets of uh, civilization with you know, their hands on nuclear weapons. It is a frightening scenario, but don't, don't, don't play it lightly. It is a big deal, and it will simmer and simmer, and it's going to explode. This could be the trigger point. It doesn't have to be, but on the other hand, we, we, we need to watch it very, very closely. Now there's something else we've learned. The renewed Soviets, the new Russia under Putin, is not just sitting idly by. The United States has found that uh, the other enemy is gaining more strength. That is Russia. John Jessup has that story from our CBN News Bureau in Washington. Here's John. That's right, Pat. Russian hackers were behind the electronic break-ins of the State Department in recent months, and they used that to get into sensitive areas of the White House computer system. CNN is reporting that hackers were able to gain access to some sensitive information, like the president's schedule. The Russians have also reportedly strengthened their military. The Hill reports that a U.S. admiral says Moscow has developed a, quote, far more capable military than, for, than, than the former Soviet Union had. Admiral William Gortney is the commander in charge of defending North America. He also says Russia is employing that military capability in Ukraine. Pat, back to you. Some years ago, I was praying, and that was in the height of the Soviet Union, and uh, Ronald Reagan was president, and the Lord spoke to me, and he said, communism in Russia, the Soviet Union, is going to fall. And I announced that, and everybody said, oh, you're crazy. Of course not. They're not going to fall. They'll be here forever. Well, communism fell. Perestroika, Glasnost, do you remember, uh, under Gorbachev. And Ronald Reagan stood firm. He held on to Star Wars, and the Russians caved. And, but what the Lord also said, but then, after that period of time, they will be more dangerous. Putin is more dangerous. The old men in the Kremlin knew very well American power, and they weren't about to test it. Putin is ready to test it. He wants to show what a tough guy he is. And now they've hacked the White House uh, communications. They have sent uh, all kinds of incursions of aircraft into the Baltic area. Uh, they have moved into the Crimea and taken it over. Uh, there are in, incursions into Ukraine, attempt to take over Ukraine. And Putin is now doing the unthinkable. He's rattling nuclear capability and said this could provoke a nuclear war. That is utter insanity. We have mutual assured destruction. We have enough uh, firepower to incinerate everything in Russia, and he knows it. But at the same time, he's willing to pay bricksmanship. They are more dangerous than the old Soviet Union. So keep your eyes, and that admiral is saying they've got better capability than we realized. John? Pat, here at home, a white police officer in South Carolina is being charged with murder in the fatal shooting of a black man after eyewitness video was released to the media. A word of warning, some may find the video graphic. The recording shows the officer, Michael Slager, shooting Walter Lamar Scott in the back several times. It also shows Scott running away and then dropping to the ground as he's repeatedly shot. The incident stemmed from a traffic stop. The victim's family is now asking for prayer. I don't think that all police officers are bad cops, but there are some bad ones out there. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to see anyone get shot down the way that my brother got shot down. We do know the truth now. And I just ask that everyone just continue to pray for my family, 
that we get through this because we do need prayer because prayer changes things yes. it changes things and justice will be served in other news, a former Muslim and an outspoken critic of radical Islam is taking her message of the need for an Islamic reformation to the news media. Speaking at the National Press Club here in Washington Tuesday, Ayan Hirsi Ali said Islam won't be a religion of peace until Muslims change their interpretations of the Islamic holy books of the Quran and the Hadith, a change she says will take decades. She points to growing examples of people living in Muslim countries who are now calling for change. These despotic states that before the Arab Spring found refuge only in repression are now coming to understand that they have to take Islamic extremism head on. But these governments, the King of Jordan, you name it, they all feel threatened by Islamic extremism. And so the time is ripe to say maybe now is when a Muslim reformation will take hold. Hirsi Ali also labeled the Obama administration's Middle East strategy as incoherent and described the current conflict with ISIS and radical Muslims as a clash of civilizations. Many of the topics she covered are from her most recent book, Heretic, The Case for a Muslim Reformation, which she also discussed in a recent interview here on The 700 Club. Well, the second Republican to enter the race for president could be the most unconventional candidate the party has seen in quite some time. Senator Rand Paul, a staunch libertarian, announced his plans with a strong message for the Washington establishment. David Brody brings us that story from Louisville, Kentucky. It had all the size of a presidential campaign, American flags, the faithful dressing for success, and an anti-Washington message. I have a message. A message that is loud and clear and does not mince words. We have come to take our country back. The Washington machine that gobbles up our freedoms and invades every nook and cranny of our lives must be stopped. While Paul's message hit traditional party themes like IRS reform and a flat tax, he's positioning himself as a different kind of Republican. That means preaching a message covering the entire Bill of Rights. His appeal to millennials references the Fourth Amendment's call against unlawful government search and seizures. His plan to gain the trust of African Americans includes a bold discussion of the Fifth Amendment's call for due process under the law. This strategy adds up to building a coalition that Paul hopes will power him to the presidency. He has the support of former Congressman J.C. Watts. The old traditional establishment guys hadn't necessarily gotten us there. So why do we do the same old thing the same old way? While Rand Paul's libertarian leaning message may indeed appeal to younger Americans, there's also a very important part of his overall strategy that should not be overlooked, and that is courting the all-important evangelical vote. For the last couple of years, he's built relationships behind the scenes with key evangelical political players. Just last week, CBN News captured Paul talking to pastors about matters of faith and politics. We need a revival in the country, you know. We need uh, uh, another great awakening with uh, tent revivals of thousands of people saying, you know, reform or you know, see what's going to happen if we don't reform. When we visited the Paul family in their home two years ago, his wife Kelly was already trying to get her mind around a presidential run. It's a contact sport. It's, it's very rough, and you do have to put yourself out there. I think it's worth it in the end for all the opportunities and to make a difference, and I, and I believe that Rand can make a difference. His supporters here in Kentucky are convinced that Rand Paul is a difference maker and will shake up GOP politics. He doesn't believe in nonviolent offenders, um, of the, anyone really staying in prison and it's time for prison reform. I think it's the one thing that will really get young voters like myself to um, go out for it, but um, I think that his policies as a whole will uh, make everyone come together. In regards to help fix some of the conditions of the African-American people, you know, education, employment, housing, and the biggest thing, felons' rights. So 
He's been talking the things that we wanted to hear. Now we're waiting for him to do it. Rand Paul has his detractors too. Critics say he's too soft on foreign policy and asserting America's military might around the world. Just one hurdle that Paul is going to need to maneuver in his quest for the presidency. David Brody, CBN News in Louisville, Kentucky. Well, if you're planning a summer vacation this year, you should save a great deal of money because the Energy Department projects gas prices will be the lowest in six years. On average, prices are expected to be nearly a dollar a gallon cheaper than last year. Some experts even think gas in some places could fall under $2 a gallon. And Pat, I'm sure many people will think that's welcome news. It is welcome to everybody except the oil companies who are having a serious, serious problem. Big news, by the way, uh, the uh, uh, company I'm trying to uh, uh, took on uh, uh, British Gas, uh, Shell uh, Oil Company, has, uh, he's going to acquire, it looks like a $60 billion deal, to take on British Gas. So the big ones are getting bigger, and, and this is an opportunity for these oil companies to start gobbling up their weaker neighbors. So there'll be a lot of consolidation in the next few months ahead. Just keep your eye on that. Well, here's Wendy with next. All right, thanks, Pat. Well, coming up, a lesson in coexistence at one of the top universities in Israel. It would seem that you could be a model between Jews, Arabs, whatever. Is that true? Yes, Hopefully. I think so. Of course. Yeah. Hear why these students are living in peace with each other after this. Ariel, I think that means Lion of God. Ariel, it's a town in the, what's called the West Bank, and you hear about so-called settlements. Till you go to Ariel and you see an incredible city, high tech city, manufacturing plants. But in addition to all that, there is an outstanding university where Israeli, Jewish, and Arab students work and study together. So, why have European governments and the U.S. State Department boycotted it? That just shows how stupid they are. Stott Ross brings us that story. This is Ariel University, located in the hills of biblical Samaria. Established in 1982, the school sought to improve higher education here, especially in the sciences, engineering, and health. We're standing in front of now a particle accelerator. Yes. What is the purpose of a particle accelerator? Does every home need one? You do have a little one in every home. Really? You have a microwave oven, okay. and in the microwave oven, you have a little particle accelerator, and it creates the radiation. Professor Aharon Friedman told me there are only a few of these machines in the world. The main research that we actually have occurring here now is cancer research. We have discovered that that particular radiation causes cancer cells to kill themselves. Kill themselves? Yes. Put them on a suicide mission. Exactly. <laughs> but all the healthy cells are alive and well. The university's home is Ariel, what some call a West Bank settlement and territory Palestinians want for a future state. It's also a land promised to the Jewish people as an eternal inheritance in the Bible. But you have been boycotted at times. We have been boycotted. Who's boycotting you? Uh, European governments. Uh, the U.S. State Department. Oddly enough, despite the politics, the university represents a model for coexistence. 15,000 Israeli, Jewish, and Arab students study here together without a problem. I spoke with a variety of the students, Shira, a Jewish woman from New York, Efrat, a religious Israeli woman, Eli Ron, a reserve soldier, Yasser, an Israeli Arab, and Yossi, whose family immigrated from Ethiopia. Why did you choose to come to Ariel University? I was looking for where there's a good psychology program, uh, something like an eclectic student body, and I found it here. Okay, any of the rest of you? Why you? Because of the professional, of course, the professional um, department here, and especially in communication. The people here are so warm and, and happy, and the teachers too. It's a small university, so uh, they can give a good care to every student they see. 
Do you agree with what he's saying about the, the atmosphere, the, yeah. the relationship? It's, uh, it's a good atmosphere. My relationship with uh, other people is uh, very good as well. And they, I don't have any problem with anyone here. Do any of you get any uh, hassles or problems from family members because you have chosen to come to school here? There are a lot of uh, hostile Arabs around here. And they can, uh, there is a lot of incidents around here. So, uh, you know, the parents are afraid for the yeah. children. It, it would seem that you could be a model for the rest of the country uh, between Jews, Arabs, whatever. Um, is that true? Yes, Hopefully. I think so. Of course. Yeah. In my apartment, the next door is, uh, is Arab uh, people, and we have a good relationship. We don't have a problem at all. Are you surprised by how effective you guys are? Well, I'm not surprised. I have to be part of the system here mm. that sends a message to everyone. The thing is that people remember this place from bad times, harsh times when things were rough or bad publicity in the news. But no one really comes here to see what happening, so they don't really know. So that's why we're here. Now maybe we will change something. Yeah. No, because I think that people really think that it's a, a very a hard or a, not a safe place, but it's not true. Chancellor Yigal Cohen Orgad credits the university's success to creating an informal atmosphere where students see each other eye to eye. Do you have many conflicts here in the university? Thanks God, not at all. We passed in Israel two intifadas, this university. There was no one evening or one day of tension between Jews and Arabs that study here. Despite its cutting-edge research, pastoral setting and quiet campus life, some see Ariel University as a controversial place. Have you had problems with the international community or with the other Israelis? We don't have problems with other universities and research institutes. We have real problems with many governments, first of all in Europe, and part of the American government, i.e. the State Department, that tries to boycott us formally or informally. Why? Because they think we don't have the right as Jews to live here in Somalia. Do you have hope for the future for peace for Israel? I am sure one day we are going to have peace with our Arab neighbors. Based on this understanding that we are here to stay, we shall find the way to live in peace. Scott Ross, Ariel University, Samaria. Wow. Ladies and gentlemen, it is a wonderful place. You read in the press about, well, we've got to move out of those settlements. Settlements, it sounds like a bunch of tents and some Bedouins with some sheep and goats. This is a thriving, modern city, beautifully landscaped, beautifully uh, organized, and one of the best universities in the world. And these diplomats who've never been there get together and say, well, we need to give those uh, settlements back. What will happen if the Palestinians get it? They will impose strict Sharia law on the people. They will crush the independent spirit of that university. They will destroy its infrastructure, and they will destroy Ariel. Now, folks, that's not a settlement. It is a modern, thriving city of people who want to be free. And if there's anything we can do is add our voice in support of it, but don't let those pinheads in the State Department make decisions that are in, in error, and that is in error, that they would indeed bring some kind of sanction against this great university. It is insanity, mm. but insanity reigns in Washington. By the way, they cut the power off the other day. They ran into, uh, and all the lights went out. I mean, good for them. Maybe if somebody, I don't know what happened to the substation. <laughs> but when, They went off, though. They, they went sure off, did. even the White House. All the lights went out. Okay. <laughs> What's next? Whew, Pat is on fire today. Well, oh, coming up, you. the long road trekked by the marathoner, marathoner known as the Barefoot Runner. If I did this, I would die some ignominious death out here in the desert somewhere, and nobody would even care about me. Find out what got him back on track next. Welcome back. You're watching the 700 Club. It's a great day, and we're glad you're with us. 
depending on the season, Dick Rubber's feet can be ankle deep in the frigid snow or slightly smoldering on hot asphalt. Dick doesn't wear socks. He doesn't wear shoes. He's one of the few enthusiasts who enjoy racing barefoot. And one day, after being hooked on drugs and alcohol, Rick found out why he was running in the first place. Rick Raber isn't like most marathon runners. He covers the 26 miles on bare feet. I ran 18 marathons with shoes, and then I started running barefoot marathons. It really forced me to run better, allowed me to run with better form. He grew up with a father who cheated on his mother and couldn't hold down a job. They had to live in five different states before Rick turned 14. It really fed into my insecurity having to start new schools and I believe that uh, it was just very hard for me to fit in in my formative years. Drugs helped Rick escape his insecurities and to fit in. He was smoking marijuana, taking LSD, and anything else he could get his hands on. One day, his brother invited him to church. While there, he says he felt compelled to follow Jesus. But soon, he was back to his old habits and felt worse than before. I totally felt like a failure. I, I totally felt like I had given up on myself. I was horrified that I was addicted to the things that I thought that I could never be addicted to. Rick joined the Navy, but after 10 months, he went AWOL and was discharged. With no direction, he hit the highways with a backpack and wandered aimlessly across the country. I hitchhiked. Uh, from Florida to California and back. I lived in missions. I lived in, in places, uh, worked day labor. He slept anywhere he could find shelter. At times, Rick would think about a better life, one free of his addictions. I remember one time in New Orleans, I was in a vacant lot and I had two mattresses propped up, teepee style and it was raining and it was cold and it was miserable and I thought, God, if you're there, please rescue me. While hitchhiking his way from Texas to Missouri, Rick caught a ride with a man who invited him to church. He says it was there he experienced God's love. He also stopped drinking and using drugs. I walked with God for a year and a half and it was, it was the most exciting time of my life. But Rick never got help for his addictions. Eventually, he started drinking again. He was in and out of church and struggling. He wanted God and his addictions too. I knew Jesus Christ was the answer by that point, but I was still so addicted. I was still so trapped. Rick married and had three children, but he was drinking heavily. After he was busted for a DUI, his wife divorced him. Again, he decided to run and drove to Las Vegas to drink himself to death. But something stopped him. I got a word from what I call now kind of like a word from God in my heart saying that if I did this, I would die some ignominious death out here in the desert somewhere and nobody would even care about me. And that God desperately wanted me to get back to Kansas City to sober up. And I remember shaking and trembling and pouring out the vodka in the, in the parking lot. And I was saying, God, I want to live again. I want to live again. Rick drove home and started going to Alcoholics Anonymous. There, he finally realized why he had been running. I didn't like that. I knew deep down it was Jesus Christ because then I would have to admit that I was wrong, that I would have to own up to my mistakes and also that I would have to put my security in Him. And then I just said, God, forgive me. Forgive me of living this selfish life, thinking that I could control my destiny, thinking that I could live above addictions, thinking that I could live beyond you. 
That's when things started to change dramatically. Rick completed AA and has been clean ever since. He earned a college degree and got a steady job and married Rebecca. He's also a chaplain at a local rescue mission where he tells the homeless men there that no matter where you've been, there is hope in Jesus Christ. I ran from God for years and now I run with God and I run to him. He is the answer to all of life's problems. Rick ran his 62nd Barefoot Marathon in Jerusalem. He runs to raise money to help people who were just like him. If we run to him, his arms are open. You may not think they are right now, but if you make that first step, if you get out of yourself enough to draw near to God, he's gonna draw near to you. There's no doubt about it. You draw near to him. That's what the Bible says. Draw near to me and I'll draw near to you. You know, you're out there crying, help me, help me, help me. But are you really looking to the source? Listen, God is so powerful. He can do everything. Yes, he can take away addiction to drugs. He can take away alcoholism. He can take away anything else that's bothering you. He can take away sexual addiction. He can make you whole. The question is, do you want it? And he's looking at, he's holding his hand out to you and say, come unto me, come unto me. I'll take care of you. Come unto me, trust me and I'll make everything right in your life. And if you want that, just call on him. Say, yes, Lord, I receive you. I take you as my Lord, and I take you as my Savior. And he will say, yes, child, come home. If you want further help, we've got a number. It's 1-800-759-0700. You can call in. Somebody's here who loves you, who cares about you. 1-800-759-0700. Let's go back to Wendy. All right, still ahead, an operation that brought a smile to the face of a little boy and one to his grandparents as well. Plus, Pat's going to answer your burning questions. Kim says, how can I communicate with my dead boyfriend? Can he hear me when I pray? He'll tackle that and much more next. Welcome back to the 700 Club. Kansas has become the first state to ban dismemberment abortions in the second trimester. The director of the National Right to Life says those types of abortions tear apart, tear apart unborn babies limb from limb after the child has a beating heart, brain waves, and more. Governor Sam Brownback says he hopes other states follow Kansas' example. Two abortion rights groups have hinted they may challenge the law in court. Well, biblical programs pulled in huge television audiences Easter Sunday. Sunday's premiere of A.D. The Bible Continues on NBC was a top 10 show with 9.7 million viewers. That was just a million viewers less than the Bible miniseries attracted to the History Channel last year. Both series were produced by Mark Burnett and Roma Downey. And ABC's airing of the Ten Commandments reached nearly 7 million viewers. Well, you can always get the latest from CBN News by going to our website at CBNNews.com. Pat and Wendy will be back with more of the 700 Club right after this. To see this week's most viewed stories, go to CBN.com. Welcome back to the 700 Club. Well, in China, an elderly man worked three jobs just to feed his family. And when their grandson was born with a major birth defect, they had nowhere to turn for help until a CBN clinic arrived in their village. Take a look. Grandma and Grandpa Du were excited when their daughter-in-law announced she was pregnant. They knew they would be raising their grandchild because their son and his wife are permanently disabled but they weren't prepared for what they saw the day Gabo was born. My heart froze. My grandson had a cleft lip. My hope crashed to the ground. How would this cleft lip affect Gabo's development? Gabo choked when his grandmother gave him his bottles, leaving him malnourished, weak, and very small. 
I knew other kids would laugh at him when he started school. Employers would turn him down, and there was no way anyone would marry Gabo with his cleft lip. He would need surgery. Mr. Du couldn't afford that. He worked three jobs, but barely made sixty dollars a month. My husband tried so hard; he never got any rest, and I was exhausted trying to take care of Gabo at my age. I admit, at one point, I felt like giving up. That's when the couple heard about a cleft lip clinic that CBN was helping to coordinate. Gabo was scheduled for surgery right away. I never dreamed that someone would give my grandson free surgery, but you did. You came just in time. Little Gabo's cleft lip was repaired by expert doctors, and today he's lighting up his grandparents' lives. Before the surgery, Gabo didn't have any strength to walk, but now he's eating. Growing and walking. You have brought us light and hope. My grandson is so good-looking, and he loves to laugh. I just know that he is going to have a bright future now. He is good-looking indeed. Well, wouldn't you like to bring life and hope to a family like that, and a little boy or a little girl like that? It's amazing、uh, what we can do with just 65 cents a day, $20 a month. We really can change lives all over the world. And、uh, we want to encourage you to call us right now and just say yes. I want to join the 700 Club. 1-800-759-0700 is the number to call, or you can log on to CBN.com and give that way. It's a great way to give. And when you do, we want to bless you with Pat's new teaching. This is amazing. It's called Be Healed. Uh, so many stories of miraculous healings. If you're going through something physically or mentally, and and you're discouraged about your healing, you need to get this. You need to get a hold of this. This is really transformational, and this can be yours when you call right now. Now, we somebody has seen this, Pat.、Yeah. Linda from Lignum, Virginia.、Mm-hmm. Have you ever heard of a Lignum? Lignum, absolutely. <laughs> it's, it's up past Charlottesville. Go ahead. All right. Well, she says I was very moved while watching Be Healed, Pat. You are. Proof that we all can live a richer, fuller life in the Lord Jesus if we only will walk with Him and believe. Awesome. Well, we want you to have this, so give us a call. Well, up next, the NASCAR driver who let Jesus take the wheel. It's all about putting that car in God's hands. For God to drive the car through my hands, my feet, my mind, and my heart. Put this car where you want it. It's my prayer. We'll ride shotgun with speedster Blake Cook, and then later. That's going to answer questions from our viewers. Diane says, "How do I know the difference between God's voice and my imagination?" It's another round of Bring It On when we come back. Hey, it's America's most exciting Christian graduate university, and、uh, new courses are opening up. They've got they've got now seventy、uh, plus fully accredited courses. It may go as high as eighty. Wonderful things being、uh, done. The board just approved something about、uh, well, science,、uh, you know, overall survey of science. Anyhow, eight-week programs, seventy、uh, accredited uh, programs, uh, school uh, scholarships are available, and uh, uh, Regent is transfer friendly. If you're in the military and you want some transfer credit, they'll give them to you. So the number to call is on your screen one eight hundred eight six six. Excuse me, one eight six six nine one zero seven six one eight. They've changed the number, so I'll, I'll miss it. All right, eight six six instead of eight hundred. Regent University, or you can log on www.regentdu. They're、um, enrolling for the summer and also enrolling for the fall. The spring has been a record enrollment, and people are really excited about this great school. So. You could be a part of it. And if you're interested in the film school, you got to watch next Wednesday. I'm interviewing one of our talented film、yeah. majors、uh, who did this incredible documentary on the Adirondacks up in、oh, New York. And you were there and doing hiking. And we went、hiking. up there to do some hiking. And、uh, but his documentary is, is, is exquisite. It's、Marvelous. amazing. So that's next week. So next a little, week. Little promo there. Thank you, sir. What's that? <laughs> Blake Cook. He is no stranger to sharp turns, high speeds, and passing other cars without signaling. But for Blake, it's not a wicked case of road rage. It's another day at the office. I get to get in a race car, go as fast as I possibly can, and make a living doing it. 
Blake Cook is a NASCAR driver in the Nationwide Series. His love of racing started as a boy with motocross. Yeah, dirt bikes was the love of my life growing up from the time I was 13 to 17 years old. I was on the road with my family racing dirt bikes. He was raised in a Christian home, but he says his relationship with God was a distant second to his love for motocross. Before I'd even take off, I would say a prayer on the line, and, you know, bow my head. And, and, but I really didn't have that personal one-on-one -on -one relationship. It almost felt like it was, now's the only time I need you, God. You know what I mean? Like, all right, I need you. I'm about to go risk my life. But when I'm done, you know, I'll talk to you next week when I'm back on that starting line. After several tears to his ACL, Blake's motocross career was over. But his stepfather suggested a new hobby. He's like, hey, hey, Blake, if I buy this race car, well, you want to drive it? And I was like, it looks kind of boring. You know, I don't know if that's my thing. I've always been against four wheels. It's always two wheels, motocross. I drove it, fell in love with it, and um, won my first race pretty soon after first driving that truck. And people started telling me, man, you're really good at this. You're natural. You can make something from it. And when I heard that with God, all things are possible and God can do anything he wants to do, that I really took it to heart. So when, you know, I had my first shot to race in NASCAR, I really wasn't that nervous, you know. I didn't even know how to shift. I, I didn't even have any experience in a manual transmission because my race cars back home were automatics. And I got to the track for my first time and I knew it was going to be a, uh, a manual transmission. But, you know, I knew that God opened this door. Fear wasn't an option. I knew he'd take care of it. And it was good. My first time in, I qualified fourth in California in the NASCAR k and Series. And they signed me full time the next year to race for them in the, the West Series. Blake says he made his Christian faith a priority and put his trust in Jesus. It's a really a, a personal one-on-one -on -one relationship. And that really started when I was about 20 years old is when, you know, I stopped quenching the Holy Spirit and started listening and reading into the Word more and studying and just really pursuing Christ. He says his Christian faith has helped bring stability to a career that can end in an instant. Shortly after my wife and I got married, I lost my sponsorship. Um, there was no ride available, and I had to surrender racing. You know, I was at a point where God opened the doors you won't open and shut the doors you won't close. Worrying does not add a single day to our lives, Jesus tells us. So I know that God's going to take care of me. I know He's going to provide my daily bread. You know, what's really helped me with that is surrounding myself with great people who are on the same mindset, accountability partners, having fellowship, building each other up, and also speaking truth into each other's lives. After a brief pit stop from racing, Blake was back in the driver's seat. He is now sponsored by Compassion International and enthusiastically speaks about his relationship with Jesus wherever he can. He's given me this platform that people listen to me, and I feel like I have a great opportunity to tell people about Jesus through that. It's hard for me not to tell people about something I love, and um, you know, every response usually has Jesus involved with it. Blake says he keeps his life and his race car in God's capable hands. I have to fully surrender everything to let God work in my life. It's not a routine, you know, it's not a, a superstitious thing that if I don't pray, I'm not gonna perform. It's all about putting that car in God's hands. For God to drive the car through my hands, my feet, my mind, and my heart, put this car where you want it, is my prayer. And um, you know, no matter what happens, I know that I've said that prayer and I've let go of everything I can do and it's in His hands someone who also has a need for yeah. speed, uh, I can understand praying before yeah. you get behind the wheel. You, know, you I, also have a need for speed. Oh, I like it. You know, <laughs> I, 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 I was given by the staff a Christmas present, uh, the petty driving experience, and I went down to the Charlotte Motor Race and was put into a race car wow. and was told what I was supposed to do with it, and then I did 30 laps around the... How fast did you get? It had a governor on it. I, I, I did my best to get it. I got to 145 miles an hour. Really? And it was so slow. <laughs> it felt slow? <laughs> yeah. That's well, you know, that Charlotte thing, it goes up a hill, and then you turn. And the idea is when you get to the top of it, you never put your brakes on, ever. Mm. All you do is let up on the gas and then slam it down again and come over the top and down the side. Mm. Oh, it, it was fun. Right. But, 
Well, I did 30 laps. I've never made it to 145. It's, 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 it's like, oh, you haven't. Well, <laughs> it, it, but I wanted more speed. I thought I could, if I could get up to 175, 180 miles an hour, it'll really be a kick. But it was, whoa. Why, why does this not surprise me about you? <laughs> I don't know, darling. I'm so placid, just a quiet old guy yeah, sitting here on who television. Who recently had a red Corvette. We'll yeah, get, we'll baby. Go there. All right. All right. Nice? We got some great questions today. Diane writes, how can I confirm that God is talking to me and I'm not just using my imagination? Um, Hebrews at least chapter 6 talks about those who through reason abuse have their sex senses exercised to discern good from evil. There's no substitute for practicing the presence of God. You have to listen to the voice of the Lord, listen to God, and, and you'll begin to discern what is your voice and what is Satan's voice and what is your friend's voice and what is God's voice. But it's through reason of use. There's no substitute for it, mm. for practicing the presence of God. All right? Amen. Kim writes, my boyfriend of many years passed away back in two, 2013. He was a pastor and is deeply missed. How can I communicate with him? Meaning, can he hear me through prayer? I miss him so much. He died way too early in his 40s and had touched many lives in his short span of life. You remember David got a woman pregnant and they had a baby and the baby died. And David said, <clears throat> I can't go to him, and he can come, uh, you, know, uh, you know, no, he can't come to me, but one day I'll go to him. Mm. Uh, you, you will die one day, and you will be reunited with your loved ones. But right now, you're not going to contact the dead. The Bible says between us, there's a great gulf fixed, and you're not going to cross from one side to the other. So don't try it. And anybody that thinks they can do it, they're a bunch of, of frauds. Uh, you know, psychics and mystics and all this stuff, they're, they're, they're in touch with demonic spirits. Don't do it. You can't do it. I mean, the guy's dead, so take it and, and get on with your life. All right. You know, I know people that have lost loved ones and have had dreams where God has graciously given them, yeah. shown them their loved one in heaven rejoicing. I think well, God is gracious that's, that's to do nice. that. That's different. That's not communicating the, with what, the dead. This, what's called a familial spirit. The spirit comes and pretends to be your Aunt Manny or your, you know, yeah. Uncle George or whatever you. Fake. That's dangerous. Demonic. All right. All right. Cheryl writes, although our daughter was, a, was raised in a Christian home, she has become an atheist, and she and her husband are raising our two grandchildren as atheists. Recently, our two grandchildren, ages six and eight, stayed for a week in our home. I read some Bible stories to them and showed them two super book videos. My daughter was very upset when one of the girls told her. She told me she does not want me to show them again unless I first let her see them and get her permission. Was I wrong? Do I owe her an apology? Do I stop reading Bible stories and showing videos if she objects? You know, that's a really tough situation because, like it or not, parents are the ones that are the ones that the, nobody would want somebody coming in to tell them how to raise their children. It's just normal parenting, and uh, you've got a really good motive. Tell you what, get those Superbook DVDs and give them to your daughter and say, how about watching these? See what you think. Mm -hmm. And who knows, maybe she can be one back to the Lord. If she started that way, and uh, bring up a child, the Bible says, and the way they'll go, and when they get old, they won't depart from it. So you brought her up in the right way, and how she got into this, we don't know. But somehow or the other, I would just be much in prayer for this daughter that she will, will uh, come back to her senses, and she will. There'll be some crisis in her life where she'll have to uh, call, call uh, on the Lord. But uh, it's a shame, but every, the parent, you cannot violate the wishes of a parent. You just can't do it, mm -hmm. all right? Yeah. I mean, if it's really bad, I mean, if she's abusing the kid, take the children away from her, you know, and get, get protective custody. Sure. But other than that, can't yeah. do it. But all super right. book, great idea, yeah, great advice. Right. All right, Michelle says, in casting out demons, can you order them to go back to the pits of hell where they belong? I don't want to command they, they go back to where they came from because it might be to someone that just got set free. Uh, you remember the case of the pigs and the demons of the Gadarene demoniac? And uh, they pled with Jesus not to command them to go to the pit ahead of time. And so he says, okay, you can go get in those pigs. Um, I don't know if we have the authority to condemn a demon to ultimate hell, but uh, I, the prayer I would pray is, say, that I bind your power and the forces of evil, and I command you to leave. Uh, the, I've also commanded them to go back where they came from, and they've done it. Mm. Uh, when you really want to tear something up, 
But uh, <clears throat> they will obey you. Uh, but whether you have the power to command them to go to hell, I don't know. And uh, I wouldn't obsess on it a whole lot. I think this is sort of an esoteric thing that you better just leave alone. Mm -hmm. Well, we leave you with today's power minute from Proverbs, first chapter. Whoever listens to me will dwell safely and will be secure without fear of evil. Well, that's all the time we've got. Tomorrow we'll look forward to seeing some heroes of the Civil War. Bye-bye.